Hello, and welcome to the CSJ's Beyond Westminster podcast, where we bring you the real stories from across Britain's forgotten communities. This week, the CSJ's policy director, Joe Shalom, discusses with our guests the importance of financial education and what we can do to improve financial literacy across the country. On today's podcast, we're delighted to have Robert Halfen, Conservative MP for Harlow and the chair of the Education Select Committee, John Piers, CEO of debt management firm Lowell, Steve Corris, Delivery Director at MyBank, a financial education charity, and me, Carolyn Griffith, the author of the CSJ's latest report on this subject called On the Money, a Roadmap for Lifelong Financial Learning. Welcome to the next in a series of Beyond Westminster podcasts from the Centre for Social Justice, where we're shining a light on some of the long-term challenges facing disadvantaged members of our society. Today we'll be talking about something us Brits famously don't like talking about all too much, that's money, and more specifically, how confident we are as a nation in managing our finances and making positive financial decisions. But let's be clear, we know that in the midst of a cost of living crisis, many people simply need more support and financial assistance, and the CSJ has been arguing strongly for uh, increased help for families throughout this very turbulent time. There's also a long-term question here. In recent global uh, studies, the UK have been found to fall well below international comparators like France, Norway and Canada in our financial skills, with one in two of us found to be unable to pass a financial literacy test run by the OECD. Meanwhile, 24 million people reported to the Money and Pension Service that they don't feel confident managing their money day to day, well before uh, the new pressures have emerged that the country is now facing. So what can be done about this? Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by uh, a number of guests who are very well placed to speak on this issue and to think about the way forward in building Britain's financial resilience. So firstly, I'm delighted to have Robert Halfen, Uh, With us, who's the MP for Harlow and the chair of uh, uh, the the Education Select Committee in the House of Commons. We also have John Pearce, who's the uh, CEO of Lau, who are a debt collection company on a mission to help customers take control of their debt. We're also very pleased to have with us Steve uh, Corris, who's the delivery director at MyBank, a fantastic charity that delivers financial education to uh, young people. Welcome, Steve. We also have Carolyn Griffith, Uh, with us, who's one of my brilliant colleagues here at the CSJ and the author of our recent On the Money report, which set out a roadmap for lifelong financial learning. So, Robert, if I can come to you first, if that's okay, it'd be great to have a bit of an introduction to to where you see things uh, from a sort of political perspective. You know, why is financial literacy important and and why have things gone so wrong? I think there's two things I'd like to start off with, if I may. And the first is that uh, the question of financial education in schools raises a much wider issue in terms of what we actually teach our our children. We have a very much knowledge based uh, curriculum when actually what we need is a knowledge and skills based curriculum. I mean, much of the focus is often is uh, teaching. I use this analogy, teaching children uh, the names of fish. But actually, we need to teach children how to fish as well. And I think that this lack of financial education in our schools uh, points to a much wider problem um, to the fact that we're not teaching our our children, pupils, students, uh, wider skills, whether it's financial skills, whether it's more vocational education, whether it's oracy, um, uh, whether it is more critical thinking. Um, and so uh, I think this raises a wider uh, subject in itself. And I think until we change that, um, we're not going to do what we want to do about financial education. Going to the second point, why is financial education so important? Well, you've touched on this in your introduction. I mean, it is genuinely extraordinary that half of British people face failed a financial literacy test run by the OECD a few years ago. So we're, as you said, we're below, I think you said France, Norway and Austria, just above Albania in the global rankings. You know, we're supposed to be the fifth largest economy in the world. You know, 24 million adults say that they're not confident handling their money day to day. We've got all these awful financial things going on in the markets. And I guess that all of us, even on this call, on this podcast and 
many members of the public are unclear exactly what is going on. I mean, we've had different explanations of what guilts are, for example, over the past uh, few days. What does this mean? What does this mean to our economy? What does this mean for our mortgages? Um, and um, we have very, very low financial literacy. And, and what that means is that we are, uh, in essence, um, not only uh, we've got a nation of nine million adults who have poor literacy and numeracy skills, we've got millions of adults who have low financial skills, which means that they are less well able to budget in the way that they might help them in terms of their daily finances. They're less well prepared when they need to take out uh, loans or uh, look at even buying their first their first home and that can have a huge impact not just in terms of poverty financial poverty but also uh, all walks of people and all uh, on in all walks of of life and I, I liken it a little bit also to a car me- you know those people who rely on their car mechanics or their builders to be honest and straightforward of course most of them are but most many people don't have an idea of what's going on underneath the bonnet of their car and it's totally dependent on the car mechanic and that is not a good place not a good place to to be and if we don't understand the finances we're totally dependent on the advice or the people that we are uh, talking to and that means there is a uh, uh, an opening for uh, loan sharks, um, for example, who can uh, bamboozle us with the high interest rates, but paying back over many, many years. It means that when we see these so-called Klarna adverts on all the products, we almost all the products we buy uh, nowadays, we're lulled into a sense of false uh, security. So this affects us in all walks of life. And it's particularly relevant because of the the cost of the cost of living so if i was looking at the curriculum not only would i say skills have to be a central part of our curriculum all the way through from primary school onwards but absolutely financial skills need to be a central part of that so this is something that affects adults as well as children and you know part of the sort of skills agenda that you've been leading really thinking about how can we intervene at the midlife stage and talk about midlife MOTs? Um, So what do you think are the interventions that are needed to boost financial education at the school age, but also then at the adult age and into older life as well? Well, it needs to be, um, first of all, as I said, we need to have a much wider look about how we have skills in our curriculum. It needs to be embedded right through to uh, from primary school. So financial education should be on the national curriculum for primary schools. And you said that, I think, in your in your report. And, and it needs to be across uh, secondary schools um, as well, because um, I think it should be a core part of the curriculum. I think that it shouldn't just be a separate part, but when children are, or pupils are learning mathematics, for example, financial education should be a central part of that. I'd much prefer personally that children learn uh, financial education during maths uh, than than just trigonometry, for example, which has limited uses unless you have want a particular role uh, which needs trigonometry in a later life. You are everybody is going to need some kind of financial uh, education. I also think, and again, you proposed that uh, something similar to the Baker clause. And I'm passionate about careers and nothing changes unless you uh, change careers. And I've learned that with uh, trying to encourage young people to do apprenticeships as well. And we should have financial organisations that regularly come into schools to teach the children and pupils about finance. They should be visits to banks and other financial institutions where students can do work experience and learn about money. Uh, as well Uh, there should be uh you know the martin lewis type um uh, my dream would be a kind of martin lewis for young people um almost on the bbc bite size or on on television that um they would be that uh, students could learn from watching these kind of videos uh, and learning about financial i mean i learn a lot by watching martin lewis on good morning britain for example and they regularly have a cost of living 
session uh, nowadays. Many of my constituents in Harlow watch Good Morning Britain. It's invaluable. And there should be this equivalent of that for uh, for uh, young people. And I think someone like Martin Lewis or someone that could relate to younger people, I think, would be would be invaluable. But there also needs to be help for the families, because um, if we don't encourage the families to many families also face uh, financial difficulties and um don't have the knowledge that they might have in other areas. And so they need support and teaching so they can then pass that knowledge on to their, on to their children. And I, I'd like to, you know, you have m- many families reading books, their kids uh, every night, and often there are stories or examples of things that go on in life. I'd like to see a lot of these kind of books have some kind of financial examples in them as well. So all the time we're teaching, teaching, teaching. Uh, children about um, uh, finances and this isn't about turning every child into a banker and I realize that this is the bankers are not the most popular people at at this point in time what this is uh, doing is teaching a child to know a a young person to learn how to budget to learn what financial figures mean to learn that nationally if there is a crash in the markets as we're witnessing as we speak um, then there will be some, they will understand it, um, know what it means, but also know how it impacts them on their day-to-day lives. Thanks, Robert. Brilliant, brilliant answers. Martin Lewis for young people, that's a, that's a policy recommendation we, we should have made, perhaps, Carolyn. Um, but, John, I'm going to turn to you now, if I can. It'd be great to hear just from your perspectives a little bit about Lau, what you do, and, and how you have sort of come across the need for better financial education uh, in, in the UK. Thanks Joe. Well, uh, Lau recovers debts across uh, the UK. We've got over 9 million customers and that's covering debts all across the spectrum from utility to telephone companies, uh, banking, financial services and home shopping. So there's a real broad sector of, um, of debt that we actually cover with our customers. And you know, across the board, all our customers are trying to do is tackle that debt and come to a decent solution, a decent outcome where they can hopefully um, get debt free over a, you know, over a period that's acceptable to them. And I think what we see, you know, firstly when we're dealing uh, with our customers at the moment is a real feeling that as we're going through their affordability as an example, we're going into a lot of detail around what's your income, what's your level of expenditure, what's the, you know, what's the level of repayments that you can, we can come to uh, to make sure that they're sustainable. And going through that process, very, it very much highlights um, quite a lot of our customers haven't, haven't quite got the detailed grasp of how their budgets are operating in order to make the most effective decision on what the best outcome is for them. And that happens for a number of reasons. You know, some of our customers um, have, have you know, volatile incomes, some of our customers uh, quite frankly, you know, haven't taken the time to sit down and understand how their budgets are working. Um, so we see a real need there. And when we talk to customers about coming up with a solution, um, a lot of the time they're not aware of what the options are available to them in terms of whether that's debt advice, whether that's how the uh, various um, mechanisms that they've been borrowing under actually work. And it's only when it comes to us and that that's crystallised that we start to figure out ways in which they can tackle that in a long-term sustainable manner. So we've got a, a panel of customers that we do a lot of research with, and there's over 2,000 of those customers that help us uh, with those research areas. And when we talk to those about some of the more in-depth issues in terms of tackling debt, um, financial education comes up time and time again. And that's in terms of they, they're wishing that they'd understood um, a lot of the mechanisms that they've been borrowing under of how it worked, how interest works, how APRs work. I didn't understand that I had to make the payments every single month and what would happen if I missed the payment and whether or not cumulative missed payments and incurred fees. Uh, and there's a lot of areas there where customers are expected to understand quite complex financial instruments. And as you'll know in society now, more and more complex ways to borrow and more diverse ways to borrow has always been introduced. You know, if you go online now, there's, you know, there's a myriad of ways in which you can finance transactions if you want to buy a t-shirt, all the way through to, you know, different mechanisms to lease or buy a car. And what customers are saying is, a lot of the times, there isn't a full understanding of that. So I think 
there's a preventative aspect here that a lot of our customers on the panel tell us if they would have been more aware and they'd had better levels of financial education when they actually took out the debt in the first place, there'd be a much better understanding of how to have dealt with it and whether or not that debt was sustainable um, at that time. Because I've been sort of looking at you know some of the insights from your consumer panel and some of the things that you sort of hear typically, and what struck me was often the sort of not necessarily the the gap in the understanding around types of product, although that certainly came through, but also the sort of emotions around money and understanding when you're getting out of control and when a situation is moving too quickly and, and knowing how to process that. I mean, is that something that that you hit? Clearly, people come to you in a position of quite serious upset. Yeah. Is that something that you, you hear, that frustration about, oh, I wish I'd known like how to handle this? Yeah, I, I, I think an aspect of financial education that comes up amongst our customers time and time again is the fact that the, there is obviously a broader stigma around debt in the first place. So if, if they've not had a level of financial education in the past and that understanding of just what happens when you start to struggle with money, when your budgets aren't adding up, when you, know, you start to fall behind with payments, and that really, really impacts um, customers and it also impacts their ability to actually deal with it. And I think that's the second um, side of, if you like, the capacity um, when, when it comes down to dealing with financial difficulty is that if you're not aware of what the options are available to you, whether that's debt advice through to being able to you know, contact your creditor and, and come up with a, uh, something that's suitable in terms of the arrangement, what can happen quite often is people will you know, literally bury their head and they will wait, they'll wait until the situation has escalated to the point in which you know, the, the debt might have defaulted, there might be county court judgments involved. And a lot of our consumer panel say if they'd had just a better awareness of how it works, if they'd had a better awareness of the options available to them, they would have been more equipped to deal with the issue at the time and they wouldn't have got to a situation where that debt um, uh, problem has escalated and they've ended up having to you know, deal with a much more serious um, situation you know, a year or two years down the line. So, Steve, I'll, I'll, I'd like to come to you now. I mean, you know, you're at the sort of very front line of um, financial education delivery. And look, let's, let's be honest about it. People have been calling for better financial education for decades now, years and years. Have things got any better? Are, is practice improving? Are you seeing progress? And what can we do to really sort of kickstart that for the 2020s? Yeah, it's a good, great question. Um, I mean, actually, I was there at the beginning of my bank about 15 years ago, um, just before the credit crunch 2008. It's interesting. So at the time then, there was a need to try and, I'd say almost persuade people of the need for financial education. You would ring up a school or youth organisation, said you, you did money management workshops. People said, uh, maybe I'm not sure this is needed. So I think in some ways, the agenda has moved on really far. People really want it. Um, everyone, whether it be policymakers, teachers, youth workers, everyone sort of, yes, we do need this, this is a good thing to do. So in some ways, yes, the agenda has moved on massively, which is clearly a really good thing. And as Robert mentioned earlier, it's on uh, the national curriculum at secondary school age, which is a, a big win in terms of uh, it being sort of seen as something that's really important. I guess in terms of the journey, I would say still to go um, is around, I would argue, quality and consistency and scale. So, um, I mean, in some ways, there is a lot of financial education out there now, which is great. You know, there are lots of websites, there are lots of Twitter feeds and videos and podcasts and all sorts of other stuff. And um, I guess if you think about it, like for anyone who knows what they should know and knows in advance of when they need to know it and are confident to go access that huge realm of information and guidance that's out there, that's fine. You know, you've got Google as your best friend and Google will tell you any answer you want to know. But you've got to know what you need to know and you've got to be confident to do that. And clearly there are lots and lots of people out there who aren't that. Um, and so I guess, you know, at my bank, that's sort of what we're trying to do is, the, you know, design high quality, consistent, impactful interventions to support people to, I guess, there is obviously knowledge and skills, incredibly important, but it's also with the, the confidence and the habits to be able to put those into action. Um, so the ability to actually engage in a topic for us, I think, is the, the, the bedrock of being able to move forward and sort of develop a higher level of, of financial capability. So I think there's a, say, a movement in the direction of people wanting it doing. I think the problem needs to be a greater understanding of how it needs to be done in terms of the, the complete scope of knowledge, skill, confidence, habits, behaviours. 
And I think probably then there's some wider questions that, you know, both society, politics, youth workers, charities, everyone needs to answer, which is around, I guess, how it can be done in terms of practicalities. So, you know, things like putting on the national curriculum is fantastic. Absolutely. I guess then sort of bringing that into sort of reality. Well, what does that mean to actually get high quality financial education intervention to our young people. How can we go about doing that? You know, and if we think about schools as an example, obviously schools are a fantastic place to work with young people. They are incredibly tight in terms of time. Uh, I think Robert mentioned earlier in terms of all the things on the national curriculum, time is very tight. So you have to sort of think about, well, if it's gonna be done, how and when is it going to be done? And then you think, well, actually, who is going to do it? So, um, you know, teachers, I'm sure lots of people on, on the podcast will know teachers in their lives who don't have a minute to spare in their lives because of all the, the planning and marking and everything else they need to do. Um, you know, do we want to try and you know up upskill our sort of teacher community to know quite some sort of relatively complex bits of knowledge and perishable bits of information and keep people updated and how to do it? Um, and or do we want to have specialists, people who, you know, fewer of them, but people who do more, who can go around and, and do lots of financial education, but a smaller volume of people. Um, and it's probably likely to be a combination of both. But it's trying to think through how it gets done, who's financing it. And um, there's sort of generally quite a lot. Of, yeah, there is money available for financial education within central government funds, local government funds. Very little of it is ring fenced. So I guess it's how do we sort of pull those sort of pieces together? Um, and I guess sort of finally, then we sort of have to see how all of these things combine in a sort of model that allows people to um, sort of gain a good financial sort of resilience. And I guess it's sort of also then about targeting those who sort of need it most. So I guess at, at my bank, we find that we we often do sort of a baseline assessment of the young people we're about to work with. So we sort of get a sense of, you know, who needs what and what skill levels they are. They are. We find quite a lot of young people in a mainstream school setting need a little bit of help. You know, they need to learn some new bits of knowledge about AERs and APRs and how bank accounts work and these sorts of things. But there's also a proportion of, of young people who need quite a deeper set of interventions. Now, this could be because they've got low financial capability. It could be because they've got sort of lower financial resilience. They sort of can't afford to make a, fin you know, a mistake in that sense. And so the ability to go and target resources to those who need the most I think we at my bank have made some str some strides in doing that, but I think there's also some more strides that you know everyone needs to make to to make that happen. And how much of this, in in your view, is about helping the parents? Because that's something that Rob the point Robert made quite well is you know looking at the whole family um, and how we help each other increase our financial literacy. I mean, does my bank do anything with parents alongside the young people in schools? Do so we do? We some of our programs have uh, you know. The, the young person intervention with the, the accompanying like teacher pack and family sort of set of resources so that young people can do the activities in the classroom, take them home and apply them. And look, absolutely, for those opportunities where you can have a blended type of learning that sort of both sort of slightly theoretical and experiential and has multiple sources, both the, the people, you know, the, the educators and the family, that is ideal. And that in some ways is what we should all be aiming for. I guess this is where, you know, but partly financial education, but partly as society as a whole, we, we have to consider the practicalities of trying to make this ideal happen. So I, you know, 100% would agree, I think we should be getting more families and parents to interact with their children about money. That's a hard job. And I think we should we should go for it. And we should, as a community, we should try and make that happen. But we also have to appreciate that's a very difficult job to get this uh, perfect scenario there. So any sort of work that we can do both with parents and with young people directly, I think we, we have to go for. So I'm going to bring Carolyn into the discussion now. Steve's mentioned something there called experiential learning and theoretic, theoretical sort of um, learning. I know this is something you looked at in a lot of detail in your research around financial education. What, I mean, what's going on there and what works? Mm. Um, well, we were very fortunate to work with both MyBank and Lowell actually and see some fantastic um, expressions of how experiential learning can work really well. Um, we uh, saw it on the ground in Blackpool. Uh, we went up to uh, the north of England to observe a charity called Boathouse Youth. And we targeted this area in particular because there's particularly high financial vulnerability um, in, in that area. Um, and so we went into this, this place and we saw kind of uh, 
the challenges that these young people were dealing with, what they were facing in the day to, their day-to-day -day lives, the impact of low financial capability. Uh, and then we saw this um, youth charity uh, intervene and, and um, deliver financial education in a way where kids got to uh, practice using money. So they got to do um, several different things uh, activities where they actually got to spend money in a real way, where they had to plan, where they had to budget um, and replicate um, what they might experience in their real lives. Um, and this had kind of profound impacts on them. These were teenage kids who should have received financial education at that point in schools. Um, but kind of as we found in the report, our financial education uh, offer is currently insufficient. Um, and so this was uh, kind of an outside organization coming in, delivering experiential fi financial education that was really transformative um, and, and helped them um, to kind of learn how to use money practically. Um, we also observed MyBank, who was practically going into schools and helping kids to use money uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, MyBank has seen kind of incredible improvements in terms of young people's financial capability as a result of that. Um, we also saw some interventions um, that supported young adults um, so as part of kind of housing uh, tenancy resiliency programs, uh, kids were being supported to learn how to manage their money once they had a, uh, a job and a tenancy, um, and they learned how to pay their bills, how to manage uh, budgets day to day so that they could cover food, their energy bills, um, and things like that. And, and um, loss of tenancy was reduced by up to 80%. So we've seen experiential learning has kind of profound impacts in terms of um, people be, people's financial capability increasing in a major, major way. That's really helpful. Thank you on that, Karen. And you know the the point you made earlier, Robert, about how we actually kind of get this put in place in a more structured way in schools, so that that kind of experiential learning is baked in alongside the uh, the very important knowledge as aspect of this. I mean, Robert, what, what's your sense of the appetite? Obviously, we've got a very new government at the moment. They're still sort of getting their feet under the desk and interested to hear more about their kind of plans for education policy but what is your sense of the appetite um, among uh, senior policy makers both on the Labour and Conservative side for sort of ref new reforms here because it feels like the last big change was in 2014 with financial uh, education going on the national curriculum but are you sensing a bit more interest in this space now from from policy makers or is there more work for organizations like the CSJ to do in getting it on the map? I think there's a very interesting debate going on about skills and vocational and technical education at the moment in a way that uh, in my time in Parliament, I got elected in 2010, that hasn't happened. And you've got people from Tony Blair on the centre left to uh, David Davis, MP, who's regarded as sort of a centre right, talking about the need for more skills in our curriculum and having a much wider uh, curriculum, particularly post-16, and have, possibly moving to a, a British baccalaureate um, system instead of A-levels, which would hopefully include uh, things like financial um, education as a core component of it. So I was excited about the debate. You've also got the Times Commission that has recommended something similar. Um, there are other commissions that have come out. There's a lot of talk in a way um, in terms of the new government, it's hard to know um, what um, their approach is, is, going, is going to be on, on this. Um, I suspect there are quite a lot of traditionalists in the uh, government who are kind of very, very strict about standards, understandably so, and believe in a knowledge-based, uh, predominantly a knowledge-based education system. But I think that uh, if the debate continues... I think Kit Morehouse, the Secretary of State, is open to these ideas. There'll be, uh, I'm about, as we do this podcast, I'm about to go to the Consider Party Conference and a significant number of fringe meetings on these areas that are going on in a way that they might not have happened in the, in the, in the past. So I think if the debate continues to happen, if the CSJ and the organisations here today continue to push for these things, it may be... Um, that we are knocking not necessarily on an open door, but a door that is slightly, slightly ajar. But I've always believed that um, campaigning for things is a bit like a pizza delivery leaflet. You get a million uh, leaflets through the house over the year. Not quite a million. Uh, my financial literacy is showing, but mm -hmm. you get a fair few over the year. And it's only one time you might pick it up after a rainy day or you haven't got any food or you just feel like a pizza 
And politics is a bit like that. It requires endless repetition. Um, and I think this has got to be a serious campaign by the CSJ politicians and others uh, to try and persuade the government to do this. Because and what we need to make clear, this isn't a diminution of standards. It's actually going to help people. And that what we should be doing isn't just saying financial education is something separate to you know additional it should be embedded in existing part of the curriculum in maths in english why not in history you know more learning about the financial history of our of our nation for example and what the, the history of the bank of england uh, and so on so there are many many ways that this could be that this could be done um if there is the will to to do it and Steve, I mean, that's really helpful, Robert, on the, you know, just in terms of campaigning as well and thinking about what we put on our, uh, on our, on our pizza takeaway service leaflet. I mean, Steve, if you were going to put one thing on there, one ask, maybe something Robert can sneak into a fringe discussion, um, what, what would it be? What's the key change that you think we, we need to see here to really scale this up and, um, and, and, and reform it in the way that we need to? Yeah, I think, I mean, the overarching piece would definitely be a joined up strategy. Um, so, I mean, the money and pension service have definitely moved the agenda forward in the last few years. But I think there's probably still more joined up thinking that can be done between how the money and pension service and the Treasury and the Department for Education align um, towards a sort of a joint approach to making things happen. So I think certainly that at a sort of a very high level um, is really important. I'd say probably the only other headline I would put in would be about seeing financial education in the most holistic form. So um, if, if we take it at the moment, so it's financial education on the national curriculum at key stage three and four. So everyone knows it's on the national curriculum, which is fantastic. You know, it's based under citizenship. So that's OK. So then I guess. But when you look then at the detail of what is covered in the citizen on the financial education part of the citizenship curriculum, it's relatively thin in terms of a little bit around government spending and, you know, taxes or whatever. So it doesn't cover savings budgeting you know household costs so when we talk about national you know financial education on national curriculum it's there but actually the detail the holistic nature of it is not there so um that would be my other sort of main point which is make it holistic and also you know in that sense give it the attention it deserves i mean you know coming back to your opening uh sort of statement about why we're talking about this you know it's such an important topic we can't as a nation we can't afford to do it badly so there aren't many opportunities to do it. So you've got to do it well. And then John, just I just, so it, may I just um, add one, one thing? I do absolutely agree with that. And um, I do sometimes think that everything is thrown into citizenship. It's a bit like a Christmas tree with a hundred different things pegged on, on it. And, and that, and so financial education isn't necessarily given the prominence it, it needs. So what, should, you know, go back to my point about embedding this stuff across all the uh, different subjects where possible. And, and also, I do think Ofsted should have a role, um, not necessarily it being yet another target that schools have to fill, but they should be monitoring at least and making observations about how well schools and colleges are, are teaching uh, financial education to the children. It should be part of their observations that are published. And John, you know, you, you kind of at the, I guess, the sharp edge of this when it, when it does go wrong. I mean, what are your concerns if we don't get a handle on this issue? You know, maybe even for future generations. What, yeah, what, what are your concerns there? I think there's there's definitely a, a piece on future generations continuing to get themselves into situations that are exacerbated because of that lack of education. But I think one of the things I'd point out right now is we are playing catch up as a nation. So you've got a whole adult population who aren't as financially literate as as they need to be to tackle modern day finances, complex financial offers, and there's a lot of our customers who are still in severe financial difficulty and they are not equipped with the right level of financial education to get them out of that. Now, that might mean intervention through businesses in the UK, you know, having employers help their, you know, colleagues work through financial education. It might be more adult, you know, uh, education being deployed. But I think we have to recognise that, you know, from my customer base at the moment, there's a lot of people out there who have been through the education system and, and had no help in this this degree. So there's a lot of catch up to play. And I think we need to think about the adult aspect of this as well as how we then start to alleviate it becoming an issue in the future 
through um, you know primary and secondary school education. And Carolyn, final thoughts from you on on I mean, what's the main recommendation from the report? What does government need to do? Well, there have been some fantastic points made by everyone on the panel. I, t- I totally agree. And the one that we missed out on uh, was Martin Lewis for the TikTok generation. So that's for part two. Um, you know, I think there are really two things I would say. Um, our, our headline recommendation was around putting financial education on the primary uh, school curriculum as it is in several of the devolved nations. We see this as... And isn't that too early? You know, think of playing devil's advocate, mm. you know, what... What is the evidence sort of behind that recommendation? Because it's quite a striking one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the Money and Pension Service has found that key financial behaviors that will stick with kids for life are developed by the time they're seven. Uh, And that's as a result of kids using money much earlier. They're on digital devices. They're playing games where they sometimes have access to currency and are even gambling um, as children. Um, so we really need to start early, not just to protect kids, but also to develop very strong um, financial behaviors through the course of their lives. Um, but as Steve mentioned, um, our, our, the statutory requirements around financial education in secondary school is really not strong enough. I think that when it was added to the national curriculum in 2014, we sort of saw that as job done. Um, but in fact, uh, kind of two thirds of teachers say that kids leave school without having received any financial education whatsoever. Um, so our report has called for kind of a suite of recommendations to try to strengthen statutory requirements in secondary school. So that's things like um, kind of uh, we, we want to see it housed in PHSE, like Steve called for, so that we're getting a more holistic picture of financial education, not just taxes, but really how to budget well. Um, We have called for digital passports to track financial education um, across the school journey. Um, We've called for a new legal requirement for secondary schools to kind of bring financial education uh, practitioners from charity, from the community space, from business into schools so kids are learning uh, about financial education, about their finances. Um, So really a suite of of policy recommendations to strengthen this very, very important um, kind of delivery opportunity in secondary schools to equip young people to manage what now are very complex financial lives. Well, I certainly feel like for one um, outcome of this conversation, I need to go and increase my own financial education. This has been really, really interesting. Um, And actually, as the cost of living crisis continues to bite and the economic backdrop darkens, I think we are going to all need to be thinking a lot more about about our finances and and, and for that reason it's so important that government sees this as an issue to grab hold of and and a real area for for reform. I think it sounds like we've got some strong um, ideas emerging as well from all of the panel. So I thank everyone for for, for coming on the the podcast to talk about this, this issue today. It is something that the CSJ will be continuing to bang the drum on and putting leaflets through your door at the very least, Robert. Um, So please don't bin them straight away. Um, and, uh, and we look forward to uh, you joining us next time in the next episode of uh, Beyond Westminster. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear more, subscribe to our channel for more interesting content like this and follow us on Twitter at CSJ Think Tank for more updates.